Hello, my name is Jason Solak. This will be my presentation on the Bataan Death March. I am in History Class 216, and this is the Winter 2021 semester. What is the Bataan Death March? The Bataan Death March started on April 10th of 1942 in Marvels and on April 11th in Bagark, Philippines. They later converged in Pillar Bataan and heading north to the San Fernando Railheads. At the beginning, there were rare instances of kindness by Japanese officers and those Japanese soldiers who spoke English, such as the sharing of food and cigarettes and permitting personal possessions to be kept. This, however, was quickly followed by unrelenting brutality, theft, and even knocking men's teeth out for gold fillings. As the common Japanese soldiers had also suffered from the battle for Bataan and had nothing but disgust and hatred for its captives. During the march, prisoners received little food or water and many died. They were subjected to severe physical abuse, including beatings and torture. On the march, the sun treatment was a common form of torture. Prisoners were forced to sit in the sweltering direct sunlight without helmets or head coverings. Anyone who asked for water was shot dead. Some men were told to strip naked and sit within the sight of fresh, cold water. Trucks drove over some of those who fell to fatigue, and the cleanup crews put to death those too weak to continue. Though some trucks picked up some of those too fatigued to go on, some marchers were randomly stabbed with bayonets or beaten. What led to this event? The attack on Pearl Harbor was a big contributor to what had happened because then that led to the Battle of Bataan overseas in the Philippines. The attack on Pearl Harbor was a surprise military strike by the Japanese Navy Air Service. Upon the United States attack against the naval base at Pearl Harbor in Honolulu. These attacks happened on Sunday morning December 7th 1941. The attack led to the United States formal entry into World War II the next day, which eventually led to the Battle of Bataan just over a year later. The Battle of Bataan represented the most intense phase of the Japanese invasion of the Philippines during World War II. The Commander-in-Chief of all U.S. and Filipino forces in the islands, George Douglas MacArthur, consolidated all of his Luzon-based units on the Bataan Peninsula to fight against the Japanese army. Despite the lack of supplies, American and Filipino forces managed to fight the Japanese for three months, engaging them initially in a fight retreat southward. What led to this event, part two? General Douglas MacArthur. When he returned to active duty, the latest revision of plans for defense of the Philippine Islands, called WPO-3, was politically unrealistic. Assuming a conflict only involving the United States and Japan, not the combined Axis powers. Under WPO-3, the mission of the Philippine garrison was to hold the entrance to the Molina Bay and deny its use to Japanese naval forces. If the enemy prevailed, the Americans would make every attempt to hold back the Japanese advance while withdrawing the Bataan Peninsula, which was recognized as the key to the control of the Manila Bay. The Battle of Bataan began January 7, 1942, and continued until April 9, when the commander, 
Major General Edward King Jr. surrendered to Colonel Mutu Nakayama of the 14th Japanese Army. Lieutenant General Masahara Homa and his staff encountered almost twice as many captives as his reports had estimated, creating an enormous logistical challenge. The transport and movement of over 60,000 starved, sick, and debilitated prisoners, over 38,000 equally weak, weakened civilian non-combatants who have been caught up in the battle. He wanted to move the prisoners and refugees to the north to get them out of the way of Homa's final assault on Corregidor, but there was simply not enough mechanics transports for the wounded, sick, weakened, and masses. Who was involved? The Japanese army, or General Masahara Homa, was the one in charge of the Bataan Death March. After the war, Imperial Japanese Army captured Filipino and American soldiers after they surrendered. There were 60,000 to 80,000 American and Filipino prisoners of war. Resulting in the Battle of Bataan in January 1942 was one of the most intense in the campaign. Following the victory in April, all 60,000 Allied prisoners of war marched 60 miles to a prisoner of war camp. Due to the ill treatment and abuse for Japanese soldiers, at least 5,500 Allied soldiers died during the march. Homa became known as the Beast of Bataan among Allied soldiers. Where was the D Bataan Death March located? It was located in Marvels. Philippines and the Bataan Peninsula. Marvels is at the most southern point of the Bataan Peninsula. As you can see from the picture on the right, it was not a very flat place as there is a big volcano right in the middle where the Battle of Bataan took place. Blue dots in the picture are where the Japanese were and the red dots are where the American and Filipino soldiers were during the battle. And the line where the path is was where the Bataan Death March took place. So as you can see it was not a paved path, it was not open roads, it was through jungles and the flat part near the very right of the screen is where the desert was and it was very hot, very humid, straight sunlight right on top of you. The purpose of the Bataan Death March was to move the prisoners to their camps, but the Japanese did not have enough motor transportation to transport them to the camps, so they made them walk as an act of torturing the soldiers. The Bataan Death March impacted the war by intensifying anti-Japanese feelings in the United States. The Filipino-American military was starving, poorly maintained, and suffering from tropical diseases. The army surrendered on April 9th, 1942, and the next day, the prisoners' death march began. The Japanese did not have enough food to feed the captured soldiers because they did not plan on capturing so many prisoners. So their intentions were not to starve them, but it had to happen because overall, the Japanese soldiers were the first ones to eat because they were the most important and whatever leftover food they were given to certain prisoners. The prisoners were forced to march 25 miles per day which was the average marching speed of the Japanese soldiers. So they forced to walk 12 hours per day would be around 2 miles per hour with no food, no water, no breaks being tortured, if you stopped, you were killed, if you took a break, if you had to go to the bathroom, you could not stop walking. 
Here is an image of the American survivors of the Battle of Bataan under Japanese guards before they started the death march. The Japanese military leaders had severely underestimated, underestimated the number of prisoners that were likely to be captured and were therefore unprepared logistically and materially for tens of thousands taken into captivity. As word spread of King's decision, Allied troops surrendered in groups, large and small. It was at that time that the first atrocity occurred, when Japanese soldiers summarily executed 350 to 400 Filipino officers, with prisoners of war scattered across the peninsula. The Japanese finally ordered them to Bataan's east coast and the main road there, where they were marshaled into columns and forced to march north to the railheads in San Fernando. The Japanese soldiers did not have enough food for all the troops, as you can see. The prisoners only received one meal during the entire march, if they were lucky to get food at all. Most prisoners only got their first meal when they arrived at the prison camps, which was a ball of rice, after five to ten days of non-stop marching. No food, no water during the day. At the end, you were escorted to a field or wherever they wanted you to sleep. The prisoners were given the rice balls at the end at the camps as their only meal for the entire march. As you can see on the map right here, how far these soldiers marched, and it added up to a total of 66 miles or 106 kilometers that 76,000 prisoners of war were forced by the Japanese military to endure in April of 1942. These were the early stages of World War II. Prisoners started out in the very south of the Bataan Peninsula known as Marvelous on April 10th and they met in Bataan heading north to the San Fernando Railhead. The men were divided into groups, approximately a hundred per group, and the march typically took each group around five days to complete. The exact figures are unknown, but it is believed that thousands of troops died because of the brutality of their captors, who starved and beat the marchers, and bayoneted those who walked too weak. Survivors were taken by rail from San Fernando to the prisoner of war camps, where thousands more died from disease, mistreatment, and starvation. If they stopped or were beaten along the way, they were left in the streets, and later on, when the Japanese vehicles would drive through, they would drive over the fallen American and Filipino soldiers, whether they were alive or dead. Upon arrival at the San Fernando Railheads, prisoners were stuffed into sweltering, brutally hot metal cars for the one hour trip to Capas in 110 degree heat. As you can see in the picture, those are the cars that more than a hundred prisoners were pushed into each of these. The trains had no sanitation facilities and disease continued to take heavy toll on these prisoners. The train consisted of six or seven boxcars. They packed them all into the cars like sardines, so tight that you could not sit down. Then they shut the door. If you passed out, you couldn't fall down. If someone had to go to the toilet, you went right where you stood. It was close to summer and the weather was very hot and humid. They were on the trains early morning to late afternoon without getting out. Many people died in these railroad cars. It was called a death march, not because of how many died. Of the 12,000 Americans, only about 1,700 lived to come home. But they called it a death march because of the way they died. If you stopped on the road, you were killed. If you had a malaria attack, they killed you. 
If you had to stop to defecate, they killed you. If you just couldn't take another step, they killed you. And how did they kill you? They'd either bayonet you to death, shoot you, or in some cases, decapitate you. They did not give us water. They gave us no food. The temperature was about 108 degrees. The, the Americans that were captured, a, a good 80% of them had malaria. Another 50% had dysentery. So we were gunshot wounds, malaria, dysentery, and we had to walk this distance that they wanted us to. Under these conditions, it was, it was unbearable. I think that what kept me going is this, about the second day, I made the decision that the only way I was gonna survive, survive was if I started to set goals for myself. And I would walk and I would see a, uh, I would see a herd of caribou in the distance. And I would say to myself, I must get to that herd of caribou. I didn't know where they were. I didn't know how far they were. I didn't know how many days it was gonna take me or how many hours, but I made every effort to get to that herd of caribou. No matter what happened, the Japanese told me to smile, I did. They told me to sit, I sat. They told me to march, I marched. They hit me, it was okay. They broke my nose, they broke my, knocked my teeth out, they split my head open, but I still had to go to reach those herd of caribou. Then when I got to the herd of caribou, then I'd find another goal and another goal and another goal. Every day was another goal. From that day on, I've lived my whole life that way. And uh, those people who hold on to a grudge, I think uh, have a very different philosophy of life. And that's how they live. By not holding on to a grudge, by being able to uh, roll with the punch, I think it's a lot easier to live. My life is a lot happier because I've learned how to adjust to adversities and how to deal with it. And I do believe that everybody, every man that came back from Bataan are disabled in some manner, either mentally, emotionally, uh, through physical attributes. As you just heard, from one of the survivors of the death march, Lester Tenney. It was a very brutal experience and very hard, mentally and physically. Once they got to the camps after walking their 66 miles and riding in their hour in the train car, the prisoners were put into Camp O'Donnell that was located in Capas Tarlac, Philippines. These prisoners in the picture are carrying the bodies of their fallen soldiers, carrying to them, carrying them to the burial site, where they were digging graves the whole day to bury about 44 men per day. Their entire days were spent digging these graves for their fallen soldiers. The pictures on the right are of Frank Hewlett who wrote this limerick for the Battling Bastards of Bataan. Frank was an American journalist and war correspondent during World War II. He was the chief for the United Press at the outbreak of war and was the last reporter to leave Coring Dor before it fell to the Japanese. He won the National Headline Award in 1942 from his reporting of the Bataan and Corregidor. <clears throat> Frank wrote this poem after the war about the battling bastards of Bataan. Where are the battling bastards of Bataan? No mama, no papa, no uncle Sam, no aunts, no uncles, no cousins, no nieces, no pills, no planes, no artillery pieces, and nobody gives a damn. After our front lines broke, the Everybody was told to report back or fall back to the uh, tip of the peninsula at a place called uh, Cap Cabin. And uh, once we got there, that's when we were told that we were being surrendered and for everybody to uh, destroy all of their arms and ammunition, which is what we did. They lined, it, lined us up, they counted us, and then started us out on what is now known as the, uh, as the death march. There was only one road out, 
and the minute we started marching out of that one road with guards on either side the sides of us, that's when we started running into the, uh, the Japanese troops that we'd been fighting for four months. And uh, of course, the first thing they did was they uh, they stole everything we had. They they took our wallets. They took our uh, anybody that had a ring. They took our ring. They took our dog tags and. They emptied our our uh, <clears throat> musette bags uh, on the on the on the, the ground and, and picked out whatever they wanted. And then once uh, uh, once they had taken everything that we had, and as we kept going through these uh, uh, front line Japanese troops, that's when they, they began to beat us. They they beat us with. Uh, rifle butts, they beat us with uh, sabers, they beat us with clubs and anything they could get their hands on. And uh, anybody that had a uh, helmet, uh, steel helmet uh, on their heads, they knocked it off with a uh, the rifle butt. And that went on all day long. Even uh, And even though we went by numerous artesian wells, uh, water coming out of a four inch pipe, uh, constantly flowing, no more than 20, 25 feet from the road. They wouldn't let anybody, wouldn't let anybody have a drink, nor did we, uh, they, they let us rest. Of course, uh, uh, they didn't feed us. We did stop that first night and uh, they, they surrounded us with uh, guards, with machine guns, but uh, didn't give us water, didn't give us food, but at least we were getting rest. Uh, next day, they got us up at the crack of dawn and uh, we, we started out on the same road, again, running into uh, Japanese uh, troops. And, uh, and once again, uh, day two was just like day, like day one, constantly being beaten every time we ran across the, uh, the Japanese. And then I think it was around the, uh, the middle of the second day that uh, people began to collapse. You know, we hadn't had, uh, we hadn't, hadn't had water in, uh, in a day and a half. And in the uh, in the tropics, uh, uh, it, it it's almost uh, beyond what uh, you know what you can take. And of course, uh, once anybody collapsed, uh, the, the Japanese immediately uh, immediately killed them. And it looked like uh, the Japanese were really trying to kill us all. It took me five and a half days to get to the first camp, and then the uh, Japanese commander got up and. Uh, laid down the rules of the uh, of the camp and said that uh, if any uh, were broken uh, the person would be shot which is the words that we expected to hear and uh, but finally uh, he was speaking through an interpreter an interpreter said that uh, you have come here to die and uh, I thought that was a, a pretty severe statement it didn't take us long to realize that he was telling the truth because uh Nobody knows exactly how many um, people died on the uh, on the march. Americans uh, in the Philip for the Filipinos, it was in the thousands. The Americans, the numbers vary from as low as uh, eight or nine hundred to, to as many as two thousand. And uh, but within the first forty days of our uh, uh, the, uh, being in the uh, first camp, Camp O'Donnell, another eighteen hundred Americans uh, died. And that was, uh, that's an average of 45 a day. And all we were doing was burying the dead. And I remember looking around and deciding that the way people were dying within a, a few weeks, we would all be dead. In this photo, like Jim Bullich was saying in the video, they were not allowed to rest or stop for a very long time. Just imagine walking in the hot, humid weather for hours and hours with no food, no water breaks, and like Lester Tenney was saying in his video, that he had to make goals for himself so that he could make it through each day without them knowing how long they were going to be out there and not knowing when their next meal would be. Not many people will ever understand what these people went through, being told to surrender and then being tortured while walking 66 miles being packed into tiny train boxcars for over an hour with a hundred people in there and then being held prisoner at a prison camp.
And for the people that survived and got out alive and fought through all these difficulties, it takes a very strong person to be able to do all of these things that these men did. After the war, the poster on the right, as you can see, and you can read for yourself, was a propaganda poster featuring the Bataan Death March and the Japanese mistreatment of U.S. prisoners of war. When the U.S. troops returned to the Philippines, General MacArthur took the risks to liberate prisoners of war camps before the Japanese could kill their captives. In one notorious incident, in the province of Palawan on December 14, 1944, Japanese soldiers murdered 139 U.S. prisoners of war by setting fire to trenches in which the men were taking refuge during their air raid. After the war, the Japanese commander in the Philippines, during the fall of Bataan, General Masaharu Homa was tried for war crimes, convicted and executed by firing squad on April 3rd, 1946. In this picture, you can see participants make their way through the course of the Bataan Memorial Death March at White Sands Missile Range, New Mexico on March 20th, 2016. In honor of their sacrifice, more than 6,500 people participated in the 26.2 mile march, which started on the White Sands Missile Range main post, crossed hilly terrain, wound around a small mountain, and returned to the finish line through sandy desert trails. Of course, this is not as far as they marched during the death march, but it was done to remember what happened and a very small idea of how the march was. As you can see that most of the people had backpacks on and did make it harder on themselves like they did in the actual death march, but they did not have any equipment in the death march. It was just them and the sun in the march. They also did this in the desert to simulate the heat that the soldiers had to march in during the actual death march. This is Irving Scott. He was a survivor of the Bataan Death March and Camp O'Donnell, where he stayed for about a month. He and other prisoners maintained, and maintained a strength of... Delete that. Irving Scott says, I was one of the only... Irving Scott says, I was one of only three men in the whole barracks who was able to work, and I worked all day digging graves. We dug a continuous grave and carried men and put them in there. We could dig them only about three feet deep. Usually, I wouldn't get three hours of sleep. That was the life, but it was a hell of a lot better than the men I was carrying out to the dead. You can imagine the horror of the place. <clears throat> While at Camp O'Donnell, a compassionate Japanese guard, who had secretly left food for Scott, slipped him some more food, as well as part of his rations of quinine, a medicine that is used to treat malaria. This would help Scott get stronger and make it easier to survive longer than everyone else. It was still not a lot of food, but Scott would take anything that he could get. This Japanese guard helped out Scott and another soldier that he was with in the barracks with. This would give them the advantage against everybody else, but they could not tell more people because the other guards would eventually find out, and Scott, his buddy in the barracks, and the guard could all be killed, so Scott had to keep it a secret. After he was moved to a different camp, he says there was a constant hum of the flight. There was a constant hum as the flights o went overhead, so we knew the Americans were bombing all over the place. At night, Navy planes would fly over. Then, often in the morning, 
the fighter planes from ships would get into dogfights. Things were happening, and we knew the Americans were close. Then, on early August 6th, 1945, Scott heard a loud rumble from the shock waves that were hitting the mountains and bouncing back and forth. The first atomic bomb had been dropped on Hiroshima. Three days later, a second atomic bomb, destroying Nagasaki. Soon after, the Japanese forces surrendered. Then Scott was a free man. He was 23, he weighed 98 pounds, and stood 5 foot 11 inches tall, one inch shorter than we had volunteered for the Marines in 1940. Thank you for making it to the end of my presentation on the Bataan Death March. It was a pretty hard topic to read about with all the gruesome things that happened to the American soldiers. But I made it through. Here's my work cited. The first one is the video of the survivor Jim Bollett talking. The second one is the other video of the survivor talking. The next is a book, The Battling Bastards of Bataan by John G. Dahl. It had some good information about what they did um, during the march, what they did like what the Japanese soldiers did to the American soldiers, how they tortured them with the uh, the sun treatment without wearing helmets and having to be out in the super hot 100 degree weather the whole time. Next is a YouTube video about the death march. Give me pretty general information about everything that happened. It wasn't really detailed but it was a good part. Next is the Bataan Death March. History, again, more background, went more into detail about what they did in the camps and uh, what the soldiers had to do with burying all their uh, other fallen soldiers. Next, history milestone. The Bataan Death March is basically another basic information about the death march. This had more about what led to the death march and how they uh, surrendered, how they got captured, all of that. My last one is the story about Irvin Scott and uh, what he told about his time in Cape O'Donnell, how he had to survive the guard that gave him and his one barrack buddy food they gave him extra food and uh the pills to help with malaria help fight it he also talked about afterwards how uh he received his medals and he felt really bad for the people that he had to bury but he was just happy that he made it out alive and that he was able to survive what he went through Thank you for listening to my presentation, and goodbye.